Sexton. While the Republican presidential candidates get a lot of the national headlines, here in New Hampshire, this is a contest on both sides of the aisle. President Joe Biden has a pair of high-profile Democratic challengers. One of them joins us here this morning, Marianne Williamson. Thanks Hi. for stopping by, Marianne. We appreciate Great your time. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. So when you face a New Hampshire primary voter, and they ask you not about President Joe Biden, but about your other competitor in this race, Robert F. Kennedy, and they say, why should I choose you over Mr. Kennedy? What do you tell them? I tell them that this country is moving in the wrong direction. The economic despair and anxiety that the majority of Americans are experiencing challenges us to make a real economic U-turn in this country. We need universal health care. We need free college, uh, public universities and colleges and tech schools. We need the eradication of the college loan debt. We need child care here in New Hampshire. You definitely see that. We need a guaranteed livable wage. We need guaranteed sick pay. And it's important to remember that everything that I'm talking about there is considered a moderate position in every other advanced democracy and they should be considered moderate in ours as well everything I said is granted to the citizens of every other advanced democracy and the fact that they are not here is for one reason only because our policies do more to serve the wealthy the uh, huge corporate interests insurance companies pharmaceutical companies big food big agriculture big oil uh, defense contractors. There's been such a transfer of wealth and power over the last 50 years into the hands of a very few Americans. And that has been at the expense of the average American, including those here in the Granite State. Recently, Mr. Kennedy had to walk back some comments <coughs> on abortion. Essentially, he said that he thought that the state had a compelling interest in protecting life in the womb after that first trimester. His campaign later walked those comments back, essentially said that a woman has a right to choose. A lot of Democrats are pointing to this and saying, here's yet another instance of Mr. Kennedy sounding more like a Republican than a Democrat. What, what do you think? I'm a Democrat. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I believe that, that the issue of uh, abortion is an issue of private morality, not public morality, and I don't think the government should be telling a woman what to do. What about Mr. Kennedy's comments specifically? Mr. Kennedy makes his comments, and people can judge Mr. Kennedy's comments for themselves. If he has to make comments all the time, that then his campaign the next day has to walk back, people need to um, analyze that for themselves. It, on the issue of abortion, you know, it used to be that Republicans <coughs> were the ones enforcing an orthodoxy, pro-life, and if you were a candidate and you strayed from that, it was at your own peril. Now it seems like the roles have reversed a little bit. Republicans have some nuance. They want to ban at six weeks, 15 weeks, 24 weeks, and Democrats are the ones saying, if you're not with us at abortion as, as a woman's choice is an absolute right, then that's a problem. Did you see that as a difficulty in the long run for Democrats that they may have abandoned nuance completely on this issue? Well, I think nuance on this issue actually is important. I think that, uh, as I said before, I think abortion is a moral issue. I just believe that it's a pro an issue of private morality. I do believe that for the vast, vast majority of American women, it is a decision that is not made easily. Uh, it is made upon reflection with wherever, as a woman perceives conscience, God of her understanding, whatever that is. And I believe that we should respect that. I just don't think the government it should be in there making that decision for that woman. In terms of the late-term abortions, though, and this is the game that we all get trapped <coughs> in, right? And we're, the Democrats won't say that they don't oppose it, you know, up until the day of birth, We get trapped in it because it's a false narrative. We're talking about such a tiny, tiny thing, and it should only happen, of course, only if it's for medical reasons. Then again, so it, should it be outlawed, though, for elective reasons? I, I, I have a problem getting in between a woman and her doctor, though. Do you see, I mean, when you look at what, what that actually is, this is not a woman just sauntering in uh, to an abortion clinic at nine months, and, uh, eight months and saying, hey, that, of course, anyone would find that abhorrent, anyone. Let's talk about the former president, Donald Trump, his yes. indictments obviously piling up at this point. What are the implications for the country on the long term when you have so many people who believe that all of these cases are just a, a vast political conspiracy designed to take him down? One of the things that concerns me is people don't seem to realize the importance, significance, and role of our own judicial system. The judicial system operates separately from politics. This was an independent council uh, that came up with the first group of indictments. It's a prosecutor in Georgia who uh, came up with the second. There will also be an independent counsel of the president and of the president's son. Why don't we just stand back and let the judicial system do what the judicial system is supposed to do? These are grand juries coming up with these indictments, and then it will be a jury of his peers who make the decision. This is an important pillar of American justice. This is, is there influence in, in, political prosecu in, in judicial prosecutions? To whatever extent there is, there should not be. 
Mr. Trump is saying he has an absolute right to comment on his trial and talk about it as it goes on. And of course, judges may have a different opinion of that because he's under bail conditions. What should be the consequences, in your opinion, if he makes comments like he did about saying, quote, if you go after me, I'm coming after you? This is what judges decide. This is why judges are there. It is the judge's role to decide whether that is across a line. Um, this is threatening a prosecutor. We are living at a time where people's lives are in, being threatened at some point. It is is that it is the role of the judge to make that decision. And if the if the judge says, I mean, there are all kinds of <clears throat> cases where part of the deal is you can't talk about it. And uh, once again, that's the judge's, judge's role. So if he has his bail revoked, political consequences be damned, do you think he should face that? Donald Trump should be treated like every other citizen in the United States. He is innocent until proven guilty. There are rules of due process. He should have to follow them just like any other person would who is indicted of a crime. Trump, as always, soaks up a lot of the attention, a lot of the headlines, and certainly with four courtroom dramas going, that's going to be the case for a while. But do you think too many at the national level are not giving due attention to the situation with Hunter Biden and the implications for President Biden politically in the next year? Well, first of all, Hunter Biden is not his father, so we want to make that distinction. Secondly, this is simply a matter of timing. The special counsel has not yet spoken. This is new that a special counsel was, a special prosecutor was appointed in the Hunter, Hunter Biden case. So we don't know yet. These are all, these are unknowables. We know what's happened with, uh, with Trump, but with the Biden family and the president, as well as his son, these things simply haven't come down the pike yet. Everybody needs to stand back a little. You know, there's a, there's, there's a, you know, there are judges and juries for a reason. There are prosecutors for a reason. And, uh, you know, I, I think any of us on either side of the political spectrum would wish that this had happened earlier, all of this. It, you know, some people say, oh, it's because of the politics. Some people say, and legitimately as well, well, you know, a, a prosecutor can't just bring a case in six weeks. I mean, there's a lot involved here. So I think, um, you know, so many of these things, Adam, distract us. I'm not saying that these issues are not important, but I'm more concerned. Not that, n This is not to minimize any of those issues. I'm concerned with the fact that people cannot afford rent. I'm, I'm concerned with the fact that many homeless people actually work full time. I'm concerned with the fact that one in four Americans live with medical debt and millions cannot afford uh, to even pay for the prescriptions that their doctors give them. I'm concerned with the fact that people here, look what's the environmental issues, even as they impact New Hampshire. Look what's happening to your apple crop. Look at the opioid deaths here. Look at the deaths of despair. And it concerns me sometimes when it's the media, I'm not saying the media is wrong to cover this. These things are significant. But so often, the, the turbulence of what's happening at any given moment in our political situation is used to distract us from the silent emergency of the despair that so so many people live in with in this country including in the state because it is everywhere and that's what I want to address as president I'm not doing this just to be part of the circus right. I'm doing this because we need fundamental economic and environmental reform on those policy issues you mentioned people can't afford rent what about the idea of the American dream of home ownership do young people who've been so battered uh, mm -hmm. by this modern economy <coughs> need to recalibrate their expectations for their lives that home ownership may be out of their reach in this generation well they shouldn't have to recalibrate they shouldn't have to this should be something that is handed down generation to generation. In the 1970s, the average American worker could afford a home and had decent benefits and could afford a car and could afford a yearly vacation and could afford for one parent to stay home if they wished and could afford to send their kids to college. That was in 1970s. It should be the role of government to do everything possible to make sure that that possibility of the American dream is bequeathed generation to generation. In the last 50 years, however, we have transferred 50 trillions of do trillion dollars of, of wealth into the hands of a tiny few Americans at the expense of the common good, at the expense of the public sector, so that, as you say, we have kids coming out of college now with good degrees, ready to go. But between how they're loaded down with this college debt, these loans should never have even had to exist, and they didn't until the 1970s, the fact that they cannot, you know, we... we People deride somebody just tweeting from their parents' basement. Do you think they want to be living in their parents' ba parent ba parents basements? We have young couples who are ready to go, but they're shackled. And you, as you said before, the even idea of ever owning their home at the age when they should be feeling like, I got possibility, I got an education, I'm ready to go, their dreams 
actualize their creativity, their productivity. We are shackling, economically and socially shackling, a young generation of Americans. There are more Americans whose dream at this point is to get out of debt before they die than there are Americans with a, with a realistic hope of owning a home. That is how wrong things are. That is how fundamentally wrong things are. That's why I want to be president. If you were president, would you have been <coughs> on the ground in Maui by now? Absolutely. And I would have been on the ground in East Palestine by now. Something is very, very wrong. Uh, what we consider our disaster emergency systems are clearly a disaster in and of themselves. We saw it with Katrina. <clears throat> we saw it with East Palestine, Ohio. And now we're seeing it with Maui. And what are these people getting? They're getting a $700 one-time stipend for a family, <clears throat> right? So what are you supposed to do with that? Plus assistance to help with all these, you know, the FEMA, FEMA applications, which I'm sure are, are horrifying. Now, Adam, add to that. These people who have just lost everything are being assaulted on their phones every day at this point by of course, real estate developers who are offering them. Look what's happening here. It's a kind of economic uh, imperialism, really, and colonialism of, of Hawaii, which goes back centuries, okay? They are being offered enough money by these real estate developers to just get by so they can survive, but not enough money that they will even be able to afford to live in Lahaina over the next few years. This is terrible how these people are being neglected by our government and exploited by these real estate developers. And oh. absolutely it would not happen with me as president. Marianne Williamson, thank you for joining us on Close Up. We'll see you out there on the campaign thank trail. Thank you. Thank you.